Hi, everyone. How are you? Uh, good evening. Welcome. It's so great to see you all here tonight. I think it's going to be an absolutely incredible uh, discussion tonight. Um, and thank you so much for joining us for another Brockton Library Suffrage Centennial Conversation event, which we've been doing all summer, thanks to uh, COVID-19. We've been doing it virtually, but it's been extremely successful and allows a lot of people from other parts of the country to even be able to join us which is wonder, wonderful. So tonight we're going to be talking about protecting the right to vote in a digital democracy. Um, we've had an incredible series of uh, conversations for the past several months about the women's suffrage movement, otherwise known as the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, a uh, decades-long fight ratified in 1920, actually on today, uh, back 100 years ago that allowed women the right to vote in elections and run for office. I'll introduce tonight's program moderator in a moment, but want to let you know that 100 years ago today, as I said, on August 26, 1920, it's the day that Congress signed the 19th Amendment into law. So tonight, uh, right after this at 8 p.m., we'll be marking the centennial locally here with a virtual presentation, including lighting up Brockton City Hall in the suffrage colors of purple and gold, thanks to our fine mayor who's allowed us to do that. Um, it's a ceremony that's part of a nationwide Forward into Light campaign led by the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission in Washington, D.C. Um, I want to tell you quickly about a few other things coming up in two weeks on Thursday, September 10th at 6.30. We'll be talking about bias. Um, institutional and systemic bias and its impact on services, opportunities, and, and achievements. A few weeks after that, on September 23rd, we'll have the movie Borderland, The Life and Times of Blanche Ames, and we'll have the movie's producer, Kevin Friend, in as our special guest, and he'll be happy to have a conversation with you. Um, watch our Facebook page um, probably next week sometime. We'll be releasing two suffrage craft kits for kids um, making rosettes like this, which some of our committee members have on, as well as a kit to make yellow pop-up roses. Um, back 100 years ago, if you wore a yellow uh, rose, you were in favor of the suffragists, and if you wore a red rose, you weren't. Um, I'd like to thank our library director, Paul Engel, and Board of Trustees for their support. And would like to especially thank our sponsors who have provided all the funding for the series, the Barbara Lee Foundation, and especially Mass Humanities. And I'd personally like to thank the Library Suffrage Planning Committee, who's just done an absolutely incredible job um, in keeping this program going. And I can see that several of our committee members, I think just about all of them, are they? Yeah, all of them are on tonight, which is fantastic. Um, we'll be uh, especially interested in hearing your feedback about how tonight's conversation went. So in a little while, um, Jen will put in the chat box a uh, survey that connects to Mass Humanities that uh, both them and us would like you to take um, at the conclusion of tonight's program. So without further ado, live from the safe distance of I don't know, are you in your office or? No, I'm at home. Okay, from her own home. <laughs> I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, uh, Suzanne Bump, who's the Massachusetts State Auditor, but more importantly, she's a member of the uh, Town of Easton's Shovel Town Cultural District Committee and has also been an active participant on the Borderland Suffrage Committee. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Pat. I am really excited about the opportunity to hear from uh, the group that you have assembled. Uh, uh, as, uh, as Pat has indicated, I'm Suzanne Bump. I'm the state uh, auditor. I'm also a member of the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage uh, Centennial Coalition. Uh, and just the other day, they asked me to, uh, to complete a sentence uh, for them to use uh, in some, uh, in some uh, video work that they are doing. And the, the question was, you know, why is voting important to you? Well, voting, I told them, is important to me to honor the sacrifice of those who got me the right to vote, as well as the struggles of those who are still trying to access the franchise. And you know, who, would, who would think that 100 years after women uh, 
got the right to vote and 55 years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, that there would still be concerns about um, access to the ballot as well as the security of our ballot. And so you have put together a really timely uh, topic and I, um, I, I thank you. Um, let's turn right now to, in fact, our, uh, our panelists. Um, I'm just going to mention your names um, I, and, uh, and you could, uh, and, and then we'll begin, then we'll begin our, uh, our, our conversation. We'll do it in sort of round robin fashion. I have a couple of questions uh, that I'll pose to, uh, to each of you. And, and then um, assuming we still have time, which we should, we can maybe have a little bit back and forth and you can, uh, you can comment on one another's comments or even pose questions to, uh, to one another. But let's start off with a man who has already been mentioned by Pat, and that is Mayor Robert Sullivan, mayor of the city of, uh, of Brockton. Um, so, so Mayor Sullivan, I wondered if you could just give us a little bit of an overview of the voting process, um, particularly this year uh, when we are afflicted by this uh, uh, pandemic and we're facing new procedures. Could you tell us a little bit about how people register to vote and how they can access the ballot, as well as any specific concerns that you might have about voting um, in uh, 2020 in the primary election? which takes place on, uh, on Tuesday, September 1st, as well as in the general election. Absolutely. And first of all, I want to thank you, Auditor, for uh, everything that you do for the Commonwealth and for the City of Champions here in Brockton. Uh, and I want to thank Pat and, and everybody that spent hours and hours uh, coordinating this event tonight and all the previous events. You know, the first one that I went to was pre-COVID uh, at the main library. And I know Paul Ingalls on, and I want to thank him for his leadership. And then when COVID came and ravaged our community, uh, the Zoom is the new normal. So I'm just excited to participate. And again, what the auditor just said is 100% accurate. I mean, there's a massive election, an important election coming up in November. But the one that we locally should be thinking about is next week, right? September 1st. Um, and right now in the city of Brockton, um, the way that people are allowed to register, first of all, is in person at City Hall, 8.30 to 4.30. You can always register in the um, Elections Commission which is on the second floor, same floor as my office, but also Secretary of State Galvin's online uh, for the Commonwealth allows registration. But I will tell you right now, as the mayor and as a lifelong Brocktonian, I am um, really, really excited about the engagement that people are doing right now, Madam Auditor. The number of mail-in ballots right now is absolutely astronomical. And to the point where we had to hire additional staff, their seasonal employees, we needed to hire additional people to help the elections commissioners because they were just overwhelmed. So um, we have additional staff. We also put a drop box outside City Hall. Um, and to safeguard that every hour, um, it's checked and, it, and the ballots are taken back in and safeguarded here at City Hall. Um, and of course, uh, extensive early in-person voting at the Westgate Mall, which is... Um, on the, um, the side, the back entrance of the Westgate Mall where Joanne Fabrics is, um, the old Payless uh, shoe. Uh, and that's where we have in person. And it started uh, just uh, last Saturday. It does end this Friday. So for Thursday and Friday of this week, 8.30 it starts. Thursday will close at 6. And on Friday we'll close at 4.30. And then, of course, you can always do your absentee voting here at City Hall. Go right into the Elections Commission. But the biggest thing, and I think we're going to see some good amount of people coming up, is going to the respective in-person pollings. And one thing I just wanted to be clear about is that we're taking every safeguard, every precaution. Um, each person will get a pen and then they'll throw that pen out. Uh, everybody has to disinfect. So uh, masks are mandatory. So it's an exciting time um, here in Brockton and here in the Commonwealth. And I'm just excited to be a participant tonight. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for going over the uh, uh, provisions that you have made so that people can vote safely. Um, your uh, remarks about how many are taking advantage of the opportunity to vote by mail um, is really uh, interesting. It, it certainly does signal that the effort that started with the Secretary of State mailing out a postcard to everyone um, and informing them of their ability to request a ballot in advance um, must really be working then if you're getting if you're getting so many um, mail-in ballots already. So that's uh, that's a healthy sign for our 
uh, for, for our democracy. Um, I wondered if I might ask you just one more question before we, we move on. Um, are there any particular concerns that you have about um, ballot safety? You mentioned the drop boxes. Um, and w what about the, uh, you're securing the, uh, the, you know, the ballots and the counting of the ballots uh, and making the results known? Are you concerned um, about getting an accurate count at all? Well, I think not, not from a safeguard standpoint. We have Brockton police that are assigned. When I voted, and I did vote the other day up at the Westgate Mall, there's a Brockton police officer there on site. Uh, and, and the way that the city of Brockton, and this is when John McGarry was the elections commission and it carries through to uh, Cindy Scrivani. Um, Brockton police, uh, the night of, of election night, of course, will safeguard uh, and every, every single uh, ballot that's cast will be counted. What I think will be different this time I don't think we're going to see the final results as quickly as we've seen in other elections here in September next week and also mm -hmm. definitely in November. That's, that's, that's going to be a certainty. So um, we have Brockton Police and Chief Gomes is working diligently to assist on this. So um, I'm just going to um, make sure everybody in Brockton understands that your vote matters, your vote counts. Uh, as my grandmother Ann Hunt O'Sullivan always said when she came over from Ireland, the most important thing to do other than to pray and to love your family is to vote, 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 vote. So I will tell you that uh, we are as a community um, making sure that it's uh, user friendly this time, that it's safe because of coronavirus, but rest assured safety and the safety of your vote is paramount. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your commitment to our democracy, which you really have made real by the steps that you are, uh, are, are taking here. Um, let, let's uh, take, a, take a wider view now of uh, voting across uh, Massachusetts and talk to uh, uh, Stephanie Helm. Stephanie is the director of the Mass Massachusetts Cyber Center at Mass Tech. Is that as in the Mass Tech Collaborative, Stephanie? Yes, ma'am. That okay. is exactly right. <laughs> okay, so why don't you tell us first a little bit about what, uh, what, about what your project is Sure. And, then, and then what you're seeing in other municipalities and how you are, um, are helping uh, with, uh, with voting security. Sure. Thank you so much for including me in this event. It's, it's very timely and very important to our democracy, as everyone has acknowledged. Um, just a little bit about my background. I'm a retired naval officer. I served 29 years um, worked at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island at my last tour and stayed on as a civilian um, helping in the wargaming department and then came to the Mass Cyber Center in um, September of 2018. Um, the governor created the Cybersecurity Center, it, and you were correct, ma'am, that it is with uh, the Mass Tech Collaborative, so it's one of the uh, divisions within Mass Tech. And we have two missions in the center. One is to work with the ecosystem of Massachusetts um, to support cybersecurity development. We've got um, a, a large number of uh, very impressive cybersecurity companies that are headquartered in Massachusetts. So if you think about Rapid7, Cyber Reason, Akamai, a lot of these places make Massachusetts home. And additionally, we have a lot of companies in um, important sectors that rely upon cybersecurity. So if you think about life sciences, uh, financial organizations and um, insurance companies, they all depend on cybersecurity for the integrity of their operations. So, so that component of the economic relationship to cybersecurity is, is recognized and um, we do do some things to support that and I'd be happy to talk about that later. The, the other mission though that the center was given was to support uh, cybersecurity resiliency for the Commonwealth. So think about uh, systems that uh, the Commonwealth uses both at the executive branch, uh, the legislation, legislators, judicial, um, and then uh, your municipalities, your schools, uh, Council on Aging, all of those kinds of services that citizens depend upon. Um, there's usually a cybersecurity component to the operations that, um, that are ongoing to enable um, uh, civil government. So um, improving the resiliency is a priority for us. And 
one of the things that we have um, created at the center is a uh, cyber resilient Massachusetts working group. So this working group um, meets periodically once a month. We've got sub working groups. Um, and essentially we look across the state and see what things um, can we do to help improve the resiliency of cybersecurity uh, because it's very important. And one of the- um, Excuse me, so you, um, you are trying to help protect against, I think I can think of a couple of ways um, that a security system could be compromised. Um, one is to get, have data stolen uh, about your know, people's you know, personal, whether it's their financial data that the state collects, or it might be health data, um, or right. other kinds of that. And then also to prevent intrusions that would that would result in disruptions of services to uh, to people, whether it's the MBTA or other transportation systems, um, but even a, a benefits uh, uh, just you know, a benefits distribution uh, system uh, is 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 there is there anything else that we're talking about? Well, we're obviously yeah, yeah, we're also yeah, talking yeah. about about you voter. Have, you have that about right. Um, there, there's really um, when you talk about resiliency, you're looking at what what kind of system do you have, and potentially what kind of attack could happen. And you're absolutely right. There's information technology that is often um, targeted, and that is personally identifiable information. So it is, you wanna protect your social security number, you wanna protect your banking services. Um, if you have a health record, you have personal health information that you wanna protect. So, so you're absolutely right. There's a lot of IT that, you know, the state and municipal governments, um, nonprofits, they, take all of that information in as part of doing business. So to pay your taxes, they have to, you know, perhaps have your social security number or something, some personal information like that. But you're absolutely right that there is also what we call operational technology that could be at risk. And that in, is, is a, something like a transportation system, an electrical power grid, um, you know, water system, many of these you know, large industrial systems have components that have a small computerized mechanism in it, um, and and that can be attacked. So, so depending on what kind of a system you have and what you're really concerned about, uh, you might be looking at IT or OT. In in the state, some municipalities are worried about both information technology because of all that personal information, but they may be running a small power grid to. Um, power their their town. Right. They might be in charge of a water system that might have a component in it. So, so cybersecurity is a big responsibility for everyone, but in municipalities, for sure, it's it's a top of priority for us. And what's the threat uh, to the uh, to the to our elections process um, that you are guarding against? Is it well? Well, we, we guard against um, all cyber threats. That's kind of in general what, what our center does. We try to um, support awareness of the issue and allow people to think about what actions they can take. Um, certainly, you have to look at who the threat actor or the hacker is, right? Mm -hmm. So in some cases, when you're talking about this personally identifiable information, they're trying to make money off of you, right? They're trying to scam and, and, and steal enough personal information so that they can um, pretend to be you and, and, and get a bank loan. Or they're trying to get into the email of a business or even a, min a municipality or the state and get into that financial transaction and steal the routing information or something so that they can steal money from you. Right. When you talk about elections, you're talking generally about um, people uh, that have an objective to sow um, discontent or essentially cause some disruption to the civil um, processes within a country. So, so those are the kind of hackers. Um, I, I would just say last, in the last couple of days, um, uh, the former director of the National Security Agency, uh, retired Admiral Mike Rogers, was interviewed on All Things Considered on NPR. And, and I would, I saw some excerpts from that interview and it's, and it's pretty compelling. 
because he talks about what they were seeing in the intelligence community in 2016 elections mm -hmm. about the kinds of activities that they saw that were um, in some small cases disruptive, but in larger cases, it was more of a disinformation campaign. Right. So they were not directly attacking the voting system. They were more attacking the sense of what the public was thinking about in terms of their ability to vote. And they were using cyber to do that. Right. So that's where the cyber component um, comes into that election security in quite a big way. But as you know, um, the Secretary of the Commonwealth is primarily the re responsible for uh, election security and and they do have a plan and they do recognize um, that there is threat activity out there that they want to encourage people to think about ahead of time and and put things in place before the voting starts so that they can have secure voting. Well one of the ways that I could imagine that the voting process could be um, attacked would just be someone intruding and uh, and making a mess out of the uh, out of voter the voting rolls the the list of registered voters uh inserting names maybe taking some out um just just mixing up addresses uh is has that been a concern and what are the other uh, there's also the possibility although i the secretary of state has indicated that he um since because of the methods that we use uh, to count ballots, uh, is that affecting then the counting of the of the ballots? Uh, would uh, could possibly be uh, be impacted? Um, are those the kinds of threats that you're imagining, or um, or are there other ways that uh, that uh, a hacker could infiltrate our our system? So I. I would best like leave the, those questions to the secretary himself to respond to, but I would say that you, you have to have a cyber component for it to be vulnerable. Right. So in many cases when people vote and it's an actual piece of paper and a, and a, and a marker, there ain't no cyber there. <laughs> you yeah. know, that's a, that's a pretty straightforward um, uh, action. And now what they do in terms of um, counting the votes Again, if it's not a heavily cybered uh, process to, that depends upon that, then, then your vulnerability is very low. So it would depend specifically, I think, on what, <coughs> what system you're trying to do. And I'm sorry, <coughs> I have a barking dog. <laughs> Just a second. Uh, bubbles, come here. <laughs> here, Bubbles. The hazards of working at home here. <laughs> She's a very old dog, and so she just periodically decides it's time to bark. So sorry about that. Um, so anyway, I, to get back to the point about the system varies, and many states years ago went to very highly uh, computerized digital services, and those were the ones that I think initially everyone was very concerned about because of that um, very, very... Um, significant cyber component. I don't know what Massachusetts specifically, because when I vote, I go into a booth and I have a marker. So I, I think that there's a lot less concern, you know, in, in, in big picture in Massachusetts than there might be compared to some other, com um, other states. Okay. Well, th thank you. Thank you for that and for the work that you're doing to, uh, to protect so many of the uh, information and operational systems uh, across our cities and, and towns. Um, uh, I'd like to, to, to turn now to Stephen Frechette. Uh, Stephen has joined us, has he not? Is he here? Yes, he's there. Okay, great. I just don't, I don't have him up on my screen. Um, so Stephen Frechette is an assistant professor of cybersecurity at Bristol Community College, um, and I, I wondered, uh, I wondered if uh, if Stephen, you might tell us a little bit about uh, your first of all about uh, technology and the electoral process, and and, uh, and and keeping maintaining the integrity of that process, and then a little bit about the kinds of offerings that you have um, at uh, Bristol Community College uh, relative to 
uh, training in cybersecurity. Sure, thank you for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure to be a part of this uh, conference today. <clears throat> so I'd like to answer the second part of your question first, if I may. Okay. So uh, Bristol Community College has a, uh, has a, a fairly new uh, cybersecurity program. Um, this year, we've, uh, we've increased our enrollment from maybe we had two or three people maybe a couple of years ago. We're, we're about to bring on 50 brand new students all through like New England area, Brockton, all of our gateway cities here in the area. So we're very excited about the, the new crop of students that are coming in. They're all going to be future cybersecurity professionals working and supporting our communities uh, here in the area with good paying jobs and attaching to the companies that Stephanie had mentioned. So um, right now we offer two degree pro we offer two programs. We offer a certificate program, which is a 22 credit program for somebody who's a already in a career and wants to advance, um, say pivot from their current job into like a, another position. And then we have the traditional 65, 66 degree credit program in cybersecurity. And um, that's a two year program. It's a very comprehensive, it's very detailed, and it's completely aligned with CompTIA and NSA standards. So anybody who comes through our program is going to be uh, prepared to work in any capacity in cybersecurity. So one of the questions I always get is like, well, I wanna go on to a four year school and get a degree uh, and continue my studies. And so mo all of our classes are being aligned to several of our business uh, several of our schools within our support area. We're currently working on an articulation agreement with UMass Dartmouth, and we'll soon approach one with um, Bridgewater. And we're going to try and make it as seamless as possible, just like some of our other programs. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I'm, I have a very busy uh, fall coming up uh, with all these new students. So I would like to men ask your, answer your question about um, the, uh, the voting process. And like Stephanie had mentioned, it's like we don't have a lot of technology out there um, that's doing the voting process. And the reason is, is because, you know, when, uh, for those of us who work in cybersecurity, we understand the elements of risk. And so risk is, you know, if we have like a, uh, a ballot, you get a ballot, okay, and it comes to your home and you're going to vote electronically, all right, you have to understand that we have to do everything we can to protect that ballot from threats, okay? So we have to ensure there's no vulnerabilities within that, within that, um, within that voting process. And so I think for me personally, I think what, what is holding back the, the you know, municipalities and states and the government from using a nationwide voting mechanism is that we just don't have the safeguards in place yet because mitigating risk is the function of what we do. You wanna mitigate risk. But I think when it comes to elections, it's like you almost have to go a little further than that. You can't like just have an, an election be like 95% effective. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the government's really not gonna go, you know, be behind that. So I think we have to get to near 99.9% .9 and it has to be agreed um, by at, at the federal level, and it has to be a bipartisan agreement, and we all have to endorse that process, and it's going to be very rigorous. And I, I, I'm not sure that in this political climate we have the appetite to do that, but I'm crossing my fingers that someday I'm going to be able to vote by mail. I vote by vote by technology. So that's my that's that's what I would say about that process. Now I think that all the technology is in place for us to do those things. We all have these uh, little devices in our hands all the time. Uh, so I think the process can be done. I mean, we certainly move millions of dollars every day in the banking system to do these things. So voting seems to be a political football though. It seems, uh, it just seems like it never, never takes off. So, and I think the last thing I'm gonna say about this, and I put a lesson out there for my students is, we studied the mishap that happened in the Iowa primaries where these people were using this like, sort of like, you know, app that somebody had developed and uh, it was just full of vulnerabilities. And it's like, oh, you just set us back so far because now nobody's going to trust the technology. And so that's, what I, that's why I advocate for a very comprehensive process, completely transparent, the way that and I'm sure Stephanie would agree with this, the way that we develop our encryption mechanisms here that are now um, used in all of our technology. It, it has to be something on that level in order to make voting process a reality, uh, 
for, in terms of digital, digital technology. So by, um, by encryption process, you mean uh, things like double passwords and making it difficult for anybody to intrude and either change or steal uh, 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 information or a command that's being issued by a voter. Is that what you mean? So when I, when I talk about that, it, you know, if I'm sitting, if, if, you know, the process from end to end from end to end truly has to be completely encrypted. It can't just be encrypted in part of the way, it has to be encrypted the whole way. And so I think that um, there are applications out there that do this and encrypt communications end to end. But again, it's a very, it's a very dicey topic right now. And you know, I will say that the federal government is always trying to break encryption um, because they have invested, you know, they're always trying to get a backdoor into encryption and they'll, um, but I, so there's lots of politics around that. If you, if you read the bill that's in the, that's in the Senate right now about the section 231 revisions and they're trying to uh, provide the ability for oversight committee and to like have backdoors into encryption, that's just, that's not going to fly in the cybersecurity community. And I think that, um, so all of those things have to be protected. In other words, it's got to be completely foolproof in order to have it work. Well, there certainly are uh, concerns around uh, encryption. You're, you're talking, and I'm thinking about the, uh, uh, the whole question of whether uh, law enforcement should be able to gain access to our text messages or our phone, you know, data concerning our phone calls. And uh, the fact that they can't do that and they've been trying to work with the tech companies to sort of create this, as you say, a back door, uh, but you can't just create it for one entity. It would then be available more widely and then other people, potentially innocent people, could get, uh, have their private information accessed. Sure. Well, encryption just doesn't protect loading loading laws. It protects individuals and you know that are like reporting reporting and and as journalists, um, you know, encryption is often used to like participate in like social media networks, especially in companies that like push back against um, you know civil rights things like LGBTQ and things like that. So encryption just doesn't like protect information. It also protects organizations. It protects individuals. You know, and so you get the good with the bad with that, though. So because you're protecting all the good guys, you know, the bad guys get the protection, too. So and I think that's what the federal government is trying to do. But it's a real non-starter for those of us who work in cybersecurity. Like if there was ever a backdoor in encryption, it could never be trusted. It just, you know, the trust would eliminate. And that would and that that's an important protection in, the, in this business, I think. Right. I'm going to move on to the um, to our next panelist, but I'm going to put you all on notice that uh, we've been talking so far about sort of the mechanics of uh, of securing the electoral process. But I'd really like to see what your thoughts are about about something that Stephanie um, mentioned, which was the um, the way that our um, our uh, social media, our our other digital. Um, uh, uh, communications, digital media uh, was attempted to be hacked or um, and it was, uh, was, uh, was subject to uh, foreign forces uh, back in the 2016 elections, which probably wasn't the first time and certainly hasn't been the, the last time whether you're talking about the United States or elsewhere. So I'm just going to put you on notice um, that I'd like you to think about about that and how we might use technology to protect ourselves, maybe against some of uh, some of that. But I, while you're thinking about that, I'd like I'd next like to call upon Andrea McLaughlin. Um, Andrea is the youth program manager uh, for Mass Hire, uh, the Greater New Bedford uh, Workforce Board. Um, so, Andrea, would you would you first explain to us what the um, uh, what Mass Hire is? Uh, and, uh, and, and then um, you talk about what cybersecurity um, might mean for, uh, as a career for young people um, 
or even or even others in the workforce who might uh, take an interest in this and uh, and and, uh, and and find a new career path. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you for the opportunity to join you today for this special event. Um, welcome, and uh, yes, I am Andrea McLaughlin. I assume the position of program manager for the board's youth activities in the late fall of uh, two years ago. Um, my responsibilities include the administration of several year uh, round in and out of school youth and summer job programs that deliver services to hundreds of youth within the region. Um, and to comment on the, on the jobs that are available in cybersecurity and in digital forensics fields, currently there are, um, according to the research um, that I conducted uh, through ONET, there are 236 uh, cybersecurity occupations to date. And this is a priority field, uh, according to our Southeastern Massachusetts Labor uh, Market Blueprint. Um, there is a strong growth uh, prospects and high wages in this professional and technical services field. Um, so it's a great time for cybersecurity. Um, and the rates, uh, as of two years ago, have increased from 8% to 11% currently. Um, so this is a priority field that's been facing ongoing challenges and struggles uh, and uh, to develop a talented pipeline and retention of skilled workers. However, with this pandemic, there are always, uh, I always look at the glass half full mm -hmm. and uh, I can see that there's a, um, there's a huge need for a workforce and a huge job openings currently um, in the amount of 13, uh, 1,427 total uh, cybersecurity job openings currently. And we have totally, uh, totally employed cybersecurity workforce of 25,177. And that's within the state? State of Massachusetts, so right? 25,000 people already in this field, but we need Correct. You know, the 13,000. Correct. So what kind and of person would make a good fit for this? So, there are there are very several top uh, cybersecurity job titles, um, and I was amazed at how many um, the titles there were. But to well round this this very long list, um, there are some fun work um, companies uh, that are looking for someone with skills in um, protection and defense, and we're looking at cybersecurity defense analysts, vulnerability assessment and management, and um, then, we're, then we go into the high demands. The high demands are in the category operation and maintenance. So architectures um, are very in high demands. You wouldn't think an architecture, but it's on the list. And then we've got the hot markets, which are investigative. So you've got the uh, outside of the cybersecurity fields in digital forensics. And those are in, working in law enforcement, FBI are like craving and they want, they want cybersecurity, digital forensics, um, skilled workers um, looking to hire for data breaches and espionage. Uh, so where does one begin? Where do you, where, well, first you have to start with your, your academic tracks, uh, such as those uh, that are uh, done through our community colleges and our professors. And then we go into our four-year colleges, uh, UMass Dartmouth and Bridgewater and uh, 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 those types, you know, UMass, you know, is spread out into the region, the state, and then the national, um, then we go into four, the national levels. Then we have our partnerships within the region. Um, we have employers, faith-based organizations, parents, nonprofit, for-profit, um, that all allow opportunities for growth within the field. And so once that training is done, then we um, have uh, at the starting wage, an average wage of $92,000 for a starting position uh, for mm -hmm. someone that was right and looking for an entry level specialist technician and then those that's an average then from there we go into these feeder roles feeder roles such as networking systems engineering uh financial risk analysis security intelligence and that doesn't end there 
Then we go into our mid-level positions, analysts, consultants, penetration, testers, and then finally the advanced levels. So then we have management, administration, and then we have some um, uh, opportunities for those to advance and um, in their careers as engineer and, and uh, architects. So that's an average 92,000. Um, it starts around 50,000, can go all the way up to $130,000 a year. Wow. Staggering. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, this is not good news for us uh, as we are trying to, uh, to hire competent professionals, professionals in our respective areas of government, is it? <laughs> oh, I mean, that's, I, that's, that's jaw dropping. I, I wouldn't have uh, known that. I mean, $92,000. I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the wave of the future, right? So uh, the sky's mm -hmm. the limit. There's going to be a, a dire need as we move forward. So it's a great career path as you move forward. Yeah, there's, there's virtually no, uh, no business or government operation now that, uh, that doesn't have a system that is uh, dependent on our uh, digital uh, capabilities now. Uh, so there's a, a world of, uh, of opportunity. Um, I wondered, Andrea, so does, does uh, obviously for the higher level uh, uh, positions, uh, you need more and more education but how would, how would um, uh, are there very many um, employers, uh, particularly down, down this area that are providing entry level or internship kinds of opportunities um, in their IT departments uh, so that folks could uh, get uh, you know, some insight into whether cybersecurity might be uh, uh, a viable field for them? Absolutely. So I, I kind of had a, a firsthand experience with this, uh, with IT and graphic design and uh, cybersecurity two years ago, but a lot has changed, to, you know, from the last two years. Um, now, uh, the uh, employers that we have connected with through our uh, work that we do uh, uh, at the workforce board are in banking, are in um, CD all automotive, they're in graphic design, uh, they are in um, STEM. So we have the uh, Nye, Nye lubricants um, that uh, just uh, support uh, supported a teacher externship, uh, and then we have the other employers. So. Uh, and then previously, uh, we have had uh, opportunities, not so much in, in IT, but more so than ever. So you could see where the challenge uh, was for us in uh, keeping uh, the, the needle, you know, moving forward, progression and overachievement of, of uh, keeping our programs running uh, at, at this high level um, so that we can, uh, move that needle and, and move forward, constantly move forward, um, despite all of these challenges that we're facing. Um, so that was very, very successful programs that we've run over the summer, um, two very, uh, very critical uh, programs that have uh, allowed us the opportunity to see, uh, you know, test it out, test the waters, and then to dive into maybe more employers that we haven't reached out to. Um, healthcare is taking a drastic hit right now on um, very ultra conservative. So um, where, you know, we have to be very delicate and we have to be very sensitive to those, uh, to the needs of, of the healthcare system right now. Right, right. Well, if I could add in also, um, as I mentioned in my introduction, the center does worry about ecosystem um, support and the companies that are headquartered here. But as I said, there's also a lot of um, industries that are highly dependent upon cybersecurity. So there are a lot of opportunities for very large um, banking institutions, uh, insurance companies, but even smaller companies, even municipalities are now starting to look for somebody that you might be an IT professional, but do you have any cybersecurity background? Because that would allow you, you may not be able to you know, hire a dedicated cybersecurity person, one, but they're now looking at this as being something that is 
really got to be integrated in every kind of IT or OT kind of uh, department, whether it's um, someone that's got that experience and understanding or they can hire somebody that can help them do that. Right, right. Um, it, so I actually, Stephanie, I'm, I'm glad you spoke up because I was going to come back uh, to you now. Thank you, Andrea, for that insight. I, I'd like to see if we might have a little bit of a discussion then about the, uh, uh, the other threats um, to our electoral process that are uh, posed by uh, other kinds of misuse of, uh, uh, by, particularly by outside agents of, uh, of our social media um, through disinformation. Stephanie, you had mentioned that, um, particularly that that's where uh, our intelligence community uh, you know, saw the major uh, intrusions uh, four, uh, four years ago. Um, and we know, we've, we've heard the reports about how it has happened since then in numerous, numerous other, other countries. Um, I wondered what your thoughts were about how we can best guard about, against that. If, it, if it's in, can we use technology? to help us or, no. or, is it, or does it take some other, some other like, set of values or activities that we have to undertake as individuals to keep us from being prey to that? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. We, you know, from, you know, my background being military cyber, um, a lot of the concerns we had, when you look at some of these author authoritarian governments, um, the reason why they have cybersecurity and they have a lot of protections on their system is not because they're worried about hackers, but because they were worried about free ideas and information getting to their people. So if you go to China, they very much control the social media. Yeah. And, and you think about when the anniversary happens of Tiananmen Square, that's just not something that can get discussed on Chinese social media because you know, the, admin, the regime doesn't feel that that's in their interest and that it somehow underline, undermines their power. Um, so they have a very, um, authoritarian regimes sort of have a look at social media that it ought to be controlled. And they look at, at free countries like the United States as sort of open territory for them to, to do the disinformation that they're, they can't necessarily win the argument on the faces of the facts so they have to distort or have to somehow misrepresent issues. And that's where the real problem comes in. When you ask about what you can do, I certainly think one thing you have to do is be a, a savvy consumer of social media. You have to be, have a healthy skepticism about information that you see. And it's a joke that you say, well, it's on the internet, it must be true. But we do as American citizens kind of owe it, especially if it's thinking about how it influences your, um, your selections for government is, is this a credible source? And is it, can it be verified? And, and quite frankly, does it even make sense? Because sometimes these wild things, if, if you actually told somebody about it later, they're like, no, actually that did not make sense. I don't know why I, why I repeated it. And then don't repeat things that you don't know for sure, right? So, okay. so a lot of this is back on us as a citizen to take our civic responsibility seriously about how we um, make decisions. And, you know, we do have an open society and you can put anything out there and it's freedom of your, you know, your right to speak your mind. And um, you, you do have to just acknowledge that there are people that are going to not tell you that they're living in a different country and that they're posing with an American name to pass on information that may not be true. Right. Now, Mr. Mayor, you uh, went through a, an election campaign uh, recently yourself, and I, I'm hoping that there, that there was no suggestion of foreign interference, um, but you've had to deal with, uh, with your share, um, as most elected officials do, um, of disinformation um, that is spread so much more uh, readily across social media. And it has, it has a negative effect, obviously, not just on individual candidates, um, but it can just discourage. It can just end up suppressing 
voter participation. Do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share? I know you're going to be having to leave us shortly to turn the lights on. So yeah, no, thank you, Madam Auditor. I, I mean, I think I think you hit it on the head. I mean, it, it does um, put a bad taste in in the voters' mouth, but also the candidates' mouth. A lot of people that I know that would be quality people for public service say. Why the heck would I put myself in that position? Yeah. You know, I mean, I got three young kids and last year's mayoral election was a daunting task. And when um, social media is utilized um, in a negative way, it, it doesn't help the cause, it hurts the cause. Um, so, I mean, I think right now uh, as a community and as a Commonwealth and as a nation, we just have to be very vigilant and diligent. Um, we learn from prior elections and um, the people that are speaking tonight are the experts, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm just the mayor of Brockton and, um, and I'm proud to be, but um, you know, what we as I think as voters and making sure that we adhere to the standards and do our, 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 our duty, right. Which is to vote. And it doesn't matter what party you are, you know, mm -hmm. Republican, Democrat, unenrolled, independent, just, just vote because it matters. And it matters not just uh, for present day, but more importantly, the future and the generation that's going to come after us. So, um, I do unfortunately have to go to a board meeting and give a mayoral citation of a city employee that's retiring at 7.30 tonight. So um, I don't want to shortchange this conversation. I do want to thank uh, the auditor, of course. She's a wonderful public servant uh, and a good friend. Um, and also, I just want to thank all the panelists. This was really, really educational to me. And uh, at the age of 50, who thought I could have been educated? But I truly was tonight. And I want to thank Pat Monteith. I want to thank Paul Engel and everybody that made tonight a reality. And remember... Vote, 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 because your vote does matter. Thank you. Stay safe and God bless you all. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Steve and uh, Andrea, give you an opportunity to comment on this, uh, on this question and then open it up to, um, to members of our uh, audience to pose questions as well. So Steve, is there anything you'd like to say about disinformation and, and how we can become, uh, can, can overcome some of the uh, efforts to uh, to disrupt our elections? Yeah, so here's what I'll say about that. And this is what I say to everybody about this, is that the social media algorithms, the way they work, they are not designed to foster collaborative thinking or <laughs> debate the critical issues of our time. They're not designed to do that. So no matter where you come down, whether it's in politics or religion or any of these other like sort of like, you know, dicey topics. If you hit the like button, it, you know, if you like the, a current president or you like a current politician, you hit the like button, you're going to get more of that and more of the bad stuff too. So what how, what's been happening in society is that people are being chased down into silos. And so you've got this group over here and you've got this group over here. And social media is designed to do exactly that. Now, it's a very dangerous thing because social media, as you all know, Facebook, Twitter, they're all free. At least you think they are. But they're using your own personal information to... Um, so the very disins, you know, the disinformation, it's not an accident that they target you. They know who you are. You give away all your information and they know who you are and they exploit you in that particular way. And so it's very easy for now, Stephanie and I, we both see completely eye to eye on this. It's like social media is the poison chalice of our time. And initially when it came out, I, I enjoyed it. Um, but it, it can really be used as a, um, it's a double-edged sword these days, especially in the context of elections. So this is what I say to people. There's a great website out there called mediabias.net. All right. So you can go and check it out. And what it does is it ranks all of the, all of the news sources that produce information that you should consume about politics or anything like that. And it ranks them as left-leaning, right-leaning, and it also ranks them in terms of like sense, sense you know, if it's sense, um, sensational, all right? So for example, in the bottom right corner, you'll have like something like InfoWars, which is like a like conspiracy theory type stuff. The New York Times will be much higher up, but it's probably a little right-leaning, you know? So, and you got the Wall Street Journal, very high up, a little left-leaning. And so I tell people, it's like, trust, but verify, think of information like dog food, you know, make sure it's a good quality and make sure you understand why you're eating it and uh, make sure you like, be careful what you chew, you know, because it's like, 
Yeah, I'm telling you, you know, you can really get chased down into a silo by eating the wrong, by, by consuming the wrong information. So Where does wet versus dry fit into that? No, you don't have to. Yeah, I'll tell you, you know, you can really, it's, it's amazing. Like, once you go out, like, if you go and check that website out. You, I, I really appreciate your mentioning that. I have definitely written that down. Oh, yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll be like, hey, I subscribe to that magazine. I'm going to do that. Over there, that. You know? Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and then we'll go to uh, to our members of our audience. Andrea, do you have uh, thoughts? You've got a young, a lot of young people that you work with um, mm -hmm. who are uh, just newly emerging, um, getting exposed to uh, your variety of facets of uh, of life, um, even in terms of their uh, the way they choose their careers. Uh, they are influenced by by social media, um, you know, how is it that you try to guide, uh, you know, guide young people who are making career choices and also then electoral choices? Now I know you don't talk politics, but uh, you know, in your in your career centers, but um, but how do you how do you try to get young people to think about the information that they are taking in and acting on? Well, one of the uh, greatest opportunities that I have as part of um, my job is to look for and always um, find some grant opportunities. And that is um, how it led me to uh, Stephanie Helm and Mass Tech um, through the cybersecurity grant. So uh, I really, you know, without that opportunity, I wouldn't even be here today. So thank you, Stephanie, wow. for that. <laughs> um, but it, but... I um, I think that the way that we communicate um, uh, with our youth in our region, I mean, it, just in general, I would say, um, is to constantly uh, make help them to become aware of not just cybersecurity, but and we were talking about cybersecurity, but all um, opportunities for career pathways and uh, you know related fields um, and and also to support them in their decisions that they make. Um, they are youth, they are vulnerable, they are, you know, we have to allow them the opportunity to look at, at all sides uh, of, the, of their career pathways. Um, where it starts is um, through our connection with our school systems. Um, currently, we have uh, 12 partner schools within our region, um, all from a charter school to a vocational school to an alternative school. Uh, so we have the, uh, with the great pleasure of working with youth um, from middle school on all the way up to 24 and beyond. Um, so what we did this past summer was kind of like a uh, uh, you know, test the temperature, test the waters with our Youth Works uh, summer program and followed a, um, a double program. One was the signal success program, but the other was kind of pivoting with this work-based learning plan idea of what is a meaningful work experience. Mm. Uh, and um, through the collaboration of the Department of Education, Comcore, and uh, the Workforce Board and our Career Center, um, as a team approach, um, we um, we kind of played around with the idea of you know we have to try and figure out what this new normal is. So let's think outside the box on this. Let's pivot. What do we need? keep an open mind about? What a meaningful work experience looks like. Put in our trust in our teachers. Put our trust in ourselves. And what we, what we found out um, from the past, normally uh, youth are placed with employers at their work sites and the employers will review their, uh, you know, their meaningful work experience based on where they are at their placements. Um, and it's soft skills such as, are you coming to work on time? Are you uh, being responsible? Are you uh, handling, handling yourself appropriately? But this summer was a little bit different because we weren't, we didn't have the youth in work sites. We had went 100% virtual. So now we had the meaningful work experiences in the classroom with the teachers directly in contact with those youth. So um, we had things such as uh, uh, project-based learning, podcasts, videos, 
uh, utilization of their technology that we currently have, PowerPoints, online, Zoom, Google Classroom, Hangouts, all of the stuff that we already use, but it was sort of like the, uh, an extension of what we already have. So we had this increased demand, we had to pivot, we had to change things around, we put trust in our team, we worked together and collaborated and, at, and networked, which is what we do all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we couldn't have done it in our silos, like, like Steve had mentioned, we had to work together, we had to figure this thing out. Um, so we were successful with 200 uh, youth in our summer program, which is pretty average, average attrition rate. Um, and um, then we had another program with our teachers, uh, specifically in three of the Perkins funding schools. So they were all placed with externships and they're gonna be coming out with uh, lesson plans that's gonna be accessible to the community, to the public. And um, so those are two really great programs um, as, as springboards for what worked, what's the model. When schools are deciding you know, on programming or when to start, we're already ahead of that curve. We've already done that. Our connecting activities program is working with the schools. Um, so on behalf of the board, uh, we are working with our school systems and um, uh, trying to offer up some, you know, that breath of fresh air, that friendly hello, like, you know, we got this, you know, to worry about the other things. You don't have to worry about, you know, the Right. These things. So, so you're showing them a world of possibilities. Uh, that have been tested. Right. If I could proven. follow up a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did meet Andrea and Steve through a, the grant program that we had, which was with uh, high school students dual enrolled in community college mm -hmm. um, in cybersecurity programs. So that was a test. It was a pilot kind of program. And one thing that they gave me in terms of feedback was our youth really can benefit from mentoring and mentorship. And so taking that insight, and we learned a lot of things during that program, but that was the one thing that sort of spoke to me, like if we really want to make a difference, we really have to get people committed to taking on a personal role with um, these students. So we at Mass Cyber Center are launching a pilot uh, cybersecurity mentorship program. Right now it's for college students. Um, and we're seeking mentors um, that are in the cybersecurity profession, but we're, we're really focusing on uh, students that are um, diverse so that we can expand the diversity of the cybersecurity workforce and allow these mentors to kind of be role models for these young folks getting into this, um, this very innovative but very highly technical career path that we're gonna need more people more professionals as we, you know, expand our reliance on cyber. Well, th this has been a really fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, we have about nine minutes um, left, so I wondered if there are questions that uh, members of the audience or comments that uh, members of the audience might like to share. And Pat, are you handling those or do I get them here on the chat? Uh, um, they, if, if people are raising their hand, they can just ask the question live. Okay. So it looks like Willie has a question. All right. Want to unmute? Uh, yes. Uh, my question is, uh, I really want to hear from, um, Christopher Nielsen, um, you know, because this is this is cybersecurity is outside of my realm of expertise, and and he mentioned something that I, you know, in terms of a, a blockchain, and I just um, I just would like to hear uh, more what what he has to say about the blockchain solution. I never heard of that before. Actually, probably somebody that could explain it a little better would be Stephen. But uh, blockchain is an encryption uh, transaction management system that is fueling a lot of cryptocurrencies. You've probably heard of uh, uh, some of you know Bitcoin, Bitcoin. and some of the others. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, you know it, it's a powerful technology, and there's a lot of things going on with that. But I'd actually pass that to Steve because he's probably going to be able to explain it a little more technically. Yeah, like if you wouldn't mind, Steve. 
Yeah. Um, so blockchain is a, like a like a sort of an up and coming technology. It's it's full of promise. Um, the problem with blockchain, well, the benefit to blockchain te technology, it's, it's a universal ledger. Uh, think of it like that keeps track of all of like cryptography, uh, crypto based um, uh, currency. So the problem is the ledger gets really, really big and it's gets difficult to pass it around. But I will tell you that um, uh, crypto crypto is um, uh, Bitcoin is alive and well. And in fact, as soon as like most cybercrime happens, uh, the money is quickly exchanged into Bitcoin so it can be, you know, disseminated all out into the ether and so that the, the you know, the money sort of disappears. I, I personally know of, uh, and I'm sure Stephanie could agree with this, uh, I know of many data breaches where the money is just is stolen and just disappears. Like, you know, the bad guys don't go to the bank anymore to like rob the banks, you know, they, they rob them online. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, but that isn't because of of the blockchain no. but that's what that is it's a it's a mechanism but blockchain has a tremendous amount of promise for being able to manage something mm -hmm. transaction related and voting is a transaction if you know but security is the big big issue because it, it's not perfect yet but it has a lot of promise to be a, a mechanism for uh, for transaction management the thing i will say about cybersecurity and technology in general is that most people outside of like myself or Stephanie or Chris, like tend to be afraid of it. You know, if, you know, we tend to like back away from things that we don't understand. And, you know, you say the word encryption, you think of like, you know, these Russell Crowe movies with like numbers flying out all over the place, you know? So, but I think that once people kind of understand the way that the cryptography works and the way the mathematics works, you know, it really is a, a safe way to do things. And I'm holding out hope for um, blockchain because I think it could be a real game changer. Oh. Well, thank you for, uh, uh, for that exchange. Are there others that would like to raise their hand, ask a question or make a comment? Catherine? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Catherine Honey. I'm with the Southeast Mass STEM Network. And... Uh, also with the uh, Borderland and Brockton uh, Suffrage Committee. And so uh, I'm very interested in uh, not only suffrage, but obviously uh, STEM related uh, careers. My question has to do with uh, the recent number of unemployed people and a couple of adults that I have talked with if someone is newly unemployed and does have a facility with uh, computers and wants to explore the cyber security field, uh, what would you recommend as a first step? So, uh, Stephen, do you want to take, take yep. that? I will take that one. So. So the college itself, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, is in this like, you know, suspended state like so many institutions are. So we can't bring people onto our campus right now. And I think that's, I'm, I'm just speculating on this. It, it, it could continue past the spring, depending on yeah. how everything plays out in, in the nation and within the state uh, about like infection rates and things like that. But in a normal circumstance, yes students would be able to come to our campus and engage in cybersecurity curriculum to get like their feet wet on some of these things. And I know that internally in my department, we're talking about making some seats available in introductory cybersecurity courses for our community so that they can dip their feet into the curriculum. And hopefully it serves as an on-ramp into a, a, a well-paying STEM career. That's the goal. Okay. Um, if you do decide to do that. Is that information the network could share? We um, uh, issue a newsletter and the next one is coming out in mid-September. And so that would be wonderful information if people knew they either could go to some type of Zoom event to learn about it or that they were- Yes, yeah, so- available. 
Yep. As soon as the information is available, like we're actually working on, I was, I've actually worked on it this week. Um, we're putting together some ideas on how this could, could be done. Cause you got to remember, right. Um, so the college is in this remote online learning thing. And I think that COVID-19 has really been an inflection point for higher education. And so we already have technology and now we're just, before we might let just like think about it and say, okay, we'll take some steps. Now we just, everybody into the pool type of thing. And so now that we're all in the pool, um, we have, um, we'll have a classroom that has 24 seats and we'll have 18 uh, students that are already signed up, but that's still six seats that we don't have filled, you know? So it's like airplane seats that we, we don't have. We can either just not fill them or we could do something positive with them and like make them available, available to the community in some capacity. I don't know what, what the logistics would look like or the costs or any of that kind of stuff, but I know that I would be advocating for that to be extremely affordable to get students involved in these career fields. Um, I also wanted to make mention too, um, coming from an organization that oversees the uh, operations uh, of, the, of our local career center, that if somebody does lose their job or is looking for work, we uh, have a, uh, our Greater New Bedford Career Center that uh, provides uh, support wraparound services. Uh, we also have uh, training programs, educational, academic uh, programs, uh, training, uh, educational programs, training programs, um, and we'll even pay the youth a stipend or a wage. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities and we'd be more than happy to share that information with you um, and to support you um, if you have youth that are out of work or even at, at any age, at any age. Right. It doesn't have to be 16 to 24. It can be an adult, it could be a veteran, it could be anyone that doesn't have a job that's looking for a job. Just want, thank you. Well, as, could... as, as usual, when you get together um, on an intelligent, uh, interested group of people and uh, you know, a, 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 such a timely topic, uh, we could go on for much longer, but alas, we have to allow Pat to wrap this up um, I do uh, appreciate the participation of, uh, of all of you, particularly our panelists. Um, I did, did take some comfort in what I heard of, you know, relative to uh, uh, present day elect, uh, ballot security. Um, but I appreciate what has been said about the, uh, the threats for uh, expansion of, uh, of technology in voting until we can be absolutely certain of the security, and uh, as well as some timely, uh, you know, well-placed well reminders of how you keep an open mind and uh, you, can, you, you need to bring some skepticism to what you're reading about all of the candidates and all of the parties. So Pat, thank you so much for uh, allowing us to, uh, to have this, uh, this forum. It's been a pleasure to be with you this evening. I'm gonna turn it back to you. Okay, thank you. This, this was a great conversation. I'm somebody who got a uh, non-undergraduate degree in math back when they first started introducing um, computers and computer programming uh, to the college curriculum. So I found this conversation very, very interesting. Thank you so much to everybody. We have a link right there in the chat window um, for the uh, link to the survey. If you wouldn't mind taking that, that would be really, really great. Um, and, you know, perhaps we can have this, continue this conversation at another time, um, maybe with a little bit of a different focus than just voting, because it sounds like there's an awful lot to talk about with cybersecurity. Um, again, thank you to everybody. I really do appreciate, and I know the committee really appreciates um, the time and the effort that you've put into uh, talking about this topic. And there goes Paul with a thumbs up. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> um, all right, uh, we have a, another uh, event at eight o'clock. Um, and I don't know if you've all gotten a link to it, but if you haven't, you can go to our, um, Jen, do you have the um, page there? I'm going to put a link in right now for the um, okay. next event. Then we'll have it up 
for one minute and then I'm going to have to shut this down because then I have to activate the other link. Um, but we're going to be doing a, an event at eight o'clock, uh, lighting up City Hall, as I mentioned, in honor of today being the 100th anniversary of the day the um, uh, 19th Amendment was signed into law, which allowed Suzanne Bump um, to have run for office <laughs> and several other people. Um, you know, uh, one fact that a lot of people don't know is that um, I voted when, as soon as I turned 18, I went and registered to vote and ran for school committee that first year as an 18 year old. <laughs> no, I didn't win, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, so that um, link that Jen has just put in there is if you'd like to join us for our eight o'clock event, um, which is uh, gonna be fun because it's gonna feature the students who participated in the suffrage poetry and art competition. Um, and are we also having it live on our Facebook page? It will be live on our Facebook page. Our suffrage yes. page is gonna be there too, if you know that. And then the Brockton Public Library Facebook page will share it there as well. You can't make okay. it to the actual. Okay, link. great. Thank you all so much. Um, Hi, thank everyone. you to the panelists. Suzanne, thank you. Did it, you did a tremendous job. Really appreciate everybody's time and attention tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.